So the concepts that we discussed so far for Bohr's atom and the energy level concepts was successful to explain line spectra and different scientific phenomena that we discussed. And it was also the basis to understand and develop di different technologies. For example, the difference between traditional lamps and LEDs and lasers is related to the two phenomena that we discussed in this context, which is black blood radiation and uh, energy levels. So for traditional lamp, it's basically a heated filament type of emission, which is equivalent to the black blood radiation that we discussed. And as we said, for any object, when you heat it up, as you heat it to higher temperature, it's going to basically emit continuous spectrum with all frequencies. So it's it's based on the bulk of the sample getting heated up and emitting continuous frequency as a black body radiation. On the other hand, LEDs and lasers are uh, actually emitting selected wavelengths with specific colors because they are based on excitations within the energy levels of the atoms in your device, not the overall bulk sample of the device. So it was a successful model, however, it violated a very basic physical principle, which is the uncertainty principle. So what is the uncertainty principle? In short, it said you cannot determine the position and the momentum of the electron inside the atom simultaneously with the same accuracy. In mathematical form, the uncertainty in momentum times the uncertainty or the error in the position of the electron is going to be inversely proportional to each other. If you increase your accuracy in measuring the momentum, the accuracy in measuring the position is going to decrease and vice versa. Let's go through this example here to uh, understand the significance of this uh, principle on the uh, atomic level. So if we compare the uncertainty in the position for a baseball with these parameters here, with the uncertainty uh, in the position of an electron with these parameters, if we calculate the uncertainty in the position for the baseball is going to be basically using uh, Heisenberg equation, which is the uncertainty in the momentum times the uncertainty in the position is larger than or equals h over 4 pi. If you rearrange to solve for the uncertainty in the position is going to be h divided by 4 pi times the uncertainty in the momentum. It's going to equal 6.63 times 10 to negative 34 kilogram meter square per second divided by 4 pi times the uncertainty in the momentum, which is given right here, it's 1.0 times 10 to negative 7 times the value of the momentum itself, 6.7 kilogram meter per second. So you can clearly see that kilogram will cancel out with kilogram second will cancel out with second and meter will cancel out with the square and you will have in an uncertainty in the position in meters 7.8 times 10 to negative 29 meter it's very clear that this error in determining the position is extremely negligible in comparison to the overall dimension of a baseball. To calculate the uncertainty in the position of an electron, uh, we will need to first calculate the uncertainty in the momentum, which is going to equal the mass 
times the uncertainty of the speed. The uncertainty of the speed is going to equal, according to the uh, statement of the problem, is 1% of the speed. 0.01 times the value of the speed itself, which is 8.0 times 10 to the power 6 meter per second. The uncertainty of the momentum is going to equal the mass, 9.10. 94 times 10 to negative 31 kilogram times the uncertainty of the speed which is 0 0.01 times 8.0 times 10 to the power 6 meter per second which is 7.3 times 10 to negative 26 kilogram meter per second. Before we proceed further, it's uh, worth noting that the error in determining the velocity is, is kind of small, it's 1%. So it's, it's, it's kind of an acceptable error if you, if you uh, think about it. Uh, but when we uh, use the uncertainty in determining the momentum for the electron to find the uncertainty in determining the position of the electron according to uh, Heisenberg formula. Position uncertainty is going to equal h divided by 4 pi times the uncertainty of the momentum or 6.63 times 10 to negative 34 kilogram meter square per second divided by 4 pi times 7.3 times 10 to negative 26 kilogram meter per second. And that's the value for the uncertainties that we just calculated here. And if you carry out the calculation, you will get an uncertainty in the position of the electron that equals 7.2 times 10 to negative 10 meter. This also seems a very small error in determining the position of an object. However, if you compare it to the dimension of the atom, you will basically find that the error in determining the position of the electron, which is almost one angstrom, is actually on the same scale as the size of the atom itself. So you cannot actually tell where exactly is the electron within the atom? Because the error is larger than this overall size of the atom itself. So the uncertainty principle becomes much more significant when uh, you're dealing with atomic systems like an atom in comparison to microscopic objects uh, like what we are dealing with uh, in our daily lives. And that means that Bohr's model which states that the atom is actually circulating in a well-defined circular orbit around the nucleus is actually physically impossible because if it was correct, it would have implied that you're very accurately able to calculate the speed and the position of the electron inside the atom at any point of time, which violates the uncertainty principle as we just calculated. So um, in order to uh, develop a better model to describe the atom then, Schrodinger had a different approach. He said, since the electron is moving like a wave, we can describe it uh, with the wave function like any other wave. And in order to find the correct wave function to describe it, he used his equation, Schrodinger equation, in this form right here. I'm not gonna get into details about he, how he developed uh, his solution 
It's just that he was trying to find the correct form of the wave function as a function epsi in x, y, and z, which is the position in the electron at any point around the nucleus. However, this wave function in Cartesian coordinates as x, y, and z is very complicated because it's going to be a function of three variables. It's impossible to find. What he did was he suggested that instead of trying to find uh, in, instead of trying to find the function as a function in the Cartesian coordinates x, y, and z for the position of the electron with respect to the nucleus, he just represented the position of the electron in the polar coordinate. Polar coordinate representation is actually defining the position of the atom as a function of the distance from the origin, R, and the angle between the vector with the axis, theta, and the angle between the projection of the vector and the x-axis, phi. So instead of defining the position in terms of x, y, and z, you define it in terms of r, phi, and theta. That has proven very, very useful because it allowed separating the function, which was in three variables, into a product of three much simpler functions as uh, a function in one variable for each of them. So three ordinary differential equations that can easily be solved with a little bit of experience in, in, in calculus. So you have three separated functions, R of R, which is a function of the distance from the nucleus, which is called the radial function, uh, theta of theta and phi of phi, which are angular parts that determines the angles that decides the position of the electron. And again, we're not going to get into details about how he solved these, but at the end when he solved these functions, he found that the function phi is actually a function of a quantum number, a new quantum number called ML, which gives acceptable solutions for the values 0, plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, and so on. And then he found that the acceptable solution for theta depends on a second quantum number, L, which gives acceptable solutions for the integer values 0, 1, 2, and so on. And lastly, the third wave function give acceptable solutions which gives the acceptable energy values uh, in the atom based on quantum number n. So basically you don't need to know anything about the um, actual function itself. You just need to know that the acceptable solutions for each function correspond to um, integer values for a quantum number ml integer values for quantum number L, and it's clear here that the energies depends only on integer numbers of the quantum number N. These are some of the solutions that he developed. Don't need to memorize them. I'm just telling you that it's a complicated function in nature, but you don't need to worry about all the details of the function, you just need to know that this first solution corresponds to uh, certain values of N, L, and ML uh, quantum numbers, and that's all what you need to know to define the acceptable solutions in this case, or the uh, available uh, spaces for the electron to move within uh, the atom. Um, and based on this concept, we have epsi, which is the mathematical wave function that describes the electron motion in the atom. And then we have epsi square, which is the probability of finding the electron in any certain point in a space inside the atom. And the pictures of the electron clouds, or what we call the orbitals, are simply 3D graphs of epsi square.
based on that, describing the electron motion in the hydrogen atom as the simplest possible atom is determined by three simple quantum numbers, three integers. The first one is the principal quantum number n, which is basically an integer that takes a value one, two, three, up to infinity. And then we have the secondary quantum number, which is called L. And this takes an integer values that starts from 0, 1, 2, up to n minus 1. And then we have the magnetic quantum number ML, which takes the values 0, plus and minus 1, up to plus and minus L. The principal quantum number is basically what determines the allowed distance from the nucleus and thus it determines the energy of allowed energy levels in the atom. It's related to the distance of the electron from the nucleus. An electron in energy level one is going to be closer to the nucleus than an electron in energy level two than an electron in energy level three, uh, for example. And then Quantum number L, the secondary quantum number, actually determines the different shapes of electron clouds, or what we call orbitals. For the value of L equals zero, the shape is going to be a spherical electron cloud around the nucleus from all directions, and we give it the name S. So it's an S orbital, or an S electron cloud. And if you plot the electron probability psi square as a function of the distance from the nucleus, there's going to be zero probability at the nucleus. As you go far from the nucleus, it's going to increase till you get an optimum or most probable uh, distance for, for the electron. And then it's going to decrease again till it reaches zero be outside the atom. And uh, it is really interesting that the most probable distance uh, corresponds to the radius that Bohr was able to determine based on his model for the hydrogen atom, for example. L equals one, you will have a different shape of the electron cloud or the orbital that is actually basically two loops of electron clouds along a certain axis. So two loops along the x-axis with what is called a node in between. A node corresponds to a, a zero probability of finding the electron, while loops are actually corresponding to some probability of finding the electron. And since this orbital is actually oriented along certain axes, you will have three p orbitals for each p set. Each one of them is going to be oriented along one of the axes. One is along x-axis, one is along y-axis, and one is along z-axis. And the reason why we have three p orbitals for each set of p orbitals is that for an L quantum number value of one, you will have M L quantum number values of zero up to plus a minus L, which is plus a minus one in this case. So you will have only three possible values, minus one, zero, and plus one. And these uh, correspond to the, the three orbitals that we see in this set. For the L quantum number that equals two, we will have a different shape for the electron cloud or the orbital uh, that is basically composed of four different loops and two angular nodes. Any D set of orbitals will contain five different orbitals with the same energy and very similar shapes based on the orientation of these four loops. Uh, along a certain plane. So one of them is going to be oriented along the ZY plane and the second one along 
the xy plane through the xy axis and then one in between the xy axis and another one is going to be in the uh, xz plane and then we have a special one that is oriented along the z axis the reason why we have five orbitals in a d shell of orbitals is because for an l equal to value you have values of ml that goes from zero to plus or minus one up to plus or minus l which is basically plus or minus two so that's one three five so that's a total of five possible solutions that corresponds to the five uh, possible orbitals that we see going from an s orbital to a p orbital to a d orbital involves the development of a node so an s orbital will have uh, no angular nodes because it's a sphere with electron density in all angles around the nucleus while a p orbital will have an angular node that corresponds to a plane with zero electron probability between the two spheres and the d orbital will have two angular nodes corresponding to two zero electron probability planes between the four spheres and for a, an f orbital is going to be three angular nodes and so on the number of angular nodes corresponds to uh, the secondary quantum number value l so l equals zero for an s orbital means it has zero angular node versus p orbital with an l value of one which means it has one uh, angular node and a d orbital with l value of two which means it has two angular nodes there is a second type of nodes which is a radial node corresponding to a distance from the nucleus that has zero electron probability so one s orbital will have no radial nodes but clearly two s is going to have one radial node with zero probability separating two loops of electron density and three s will have two radial nodes separating three different loops of uh, electron probability like the s orbital is going to be a sphere with an electron probability at all distances from the nucleus two s orbital is going to be two concentric spheres with a sphere of vacuum in between that corresponds to the first radial node and then 3s will have two radial nodes so it's going to look like three concentric uh, spheres of electron clouds with two uh, spheres of, uh, of of vacuum in between with zero electron probability or electron density so this is a graphical simulation of the s orbital so if you look at the uh, yellow uh, dot in the center here this is basically a, a representation of the nucleus and when you zoom out you will start to see a sphere around the nucleus in all directions this is basically the uh, expected shape for one s orbital these uh, white dots stand for the possible positions of the electron around the uh, nucleus in the atom. So, and this here is a graphical representation of the shape of a p orbital. So, if you consider the nucleus to be right here and you zoom out, so you can clearly see two distinct loops of electron clouds above and below the uh, nucleus that's for a pz orbital and of course if you uh, think about the px orbital is going to be basically oriented uh, in the x direction instead of the z direction and then we will have a third one that is oriented in the y direction instead and uh, that plane of zero electron probability is the angular node in this case 
So again, if you uh, imagine that the nucleus here is in the center and you uh, zoom out, you will see four distinct uh, electron clouds with two planes of zero electron probability, which stands for the two angular nodes in a d orbital. So this is a, the shape of a d orbital. And again, according to orientation to the orientation of uh, of these loops, is going to be either oriented along the z x axis, so it's going to be uh, x z orbital, or along the xy axis, so it's going to be an xy orbital, and so on. And here, this is the shape of one of the f orbitals. It's a little bit more complicated than the shapes that we saw previously. The only thing that is common between f orbitals is, is that it's going to have three angular nodes between the um, uh, electron loops of the orbital in all cases. To find out the available orbitals for any atom, we're uh, ju just going to apply the rules for the acceptable quantum number values. As we said, the principal quantum number takes the value 1, 2, 3, all the way up to infinity. And then the secondary quantum number, which determines the shape of the orbital, takes the value 0, 1, 2, up to n minus 1, and then the magnetic quantum number ml takes the value 0 plus or minus 1 all the way up to plus or minus l. When we have an n equals 1, this is the first energy level. The only possible value in this case is going to be l equals 0 because l can only go up to n minus 1. 1 minus 1 is 0. So that's the only possible uh, value for L in this case. And ML also goes up to plus or minus L. So it's basically going to be zero. As we said, when L equals zero, the shape of the orbital is going to be a spherical orbital or what, or what we call it S orbital. So it's going to be only one possible solution with an S shape and we will just uh, denote that it belongs to energy level number one. Then we move to energy level number two. This is going to have a principal quantum number value that equals two. So if you look at the possible L values in this case, it's going to take the values from zero all the way up to n minus one, which is 2 minus 1, which is going to be 1. So you have 0 and 1. Again, for 0, there is only one possible ML value, which is 0. That's going to give us a spherical orbital, one possible solution, which is a spherical orbital S. Just to differentiate it from the previous one, we will put a coefficient that stands for the energy level. So it's 2S. And when L equals 1, that is going to give us a P orbital shape. And because we have three possible values for ML in this case, plus 1, 0, and minus 1, so we will have three possible orbitals that correspond to each combination of these. So we will have three uh, possible p orbitals in this set, 2p along the x-axis, 2p along the y-axis, and another p orbital along the z-axis. And then next energy level is going to have n equal 3, and for that value, l is possible to take the value 0, 1, and 2. 2 here is the maximum, which equals n minus 1, 3 minus 1 is 2. For L equals 0, the only possible value for ML is 0. And again, that's another one solution that corresponds to a spherical orbital, uh, which is slightly larger, which is 3s, just to differentiate it from the previous s orbitals. And then for L equals 1, 
that's a P-shaped orbital, which is going to have three possible ML values, plus one, zero, and minus one. So three possible combinations, three PX, three PY, three PZ. And then for L equals two, that's the four loop shaped orbital, which we call it D orbital. And for that, we will have five possible combinations of ML, zero plus or minus one and plus or minus two. So five possible orbitals, which are gonna be 3D X Z, 3D Y Z, 3D X Y, and then we have two other orbitals. One of them is along the X Y axis, which is 3D X squared minus Y squared, and the second one is along the Z axis, which is 3D Z squared. So five of them. So we can also go backwards from the symbol of the orbital, we can know what is the combination of quantum numbers that corresponds for, to this orbital. For example, for a 4D subshell, the coefficient 4 is the principal quantum number. So 4 is actually corresponding to n. So n equals 4. And then D means that L equals 2. As we learned, L equals zero is gonna be a spherical shaped S orbital. L equals one is gonna be two loop P orbital. L equals two is gonna be four looped D orbital. And L equals three is gonna be a, a little bit of a complicated shaped orbital called F orbital. L equals four is gonna give us a G orbital and so on. Since here he doesn't mention any specification of which orbital of the D orbital he means, the possible values for ML are gonna be from zero all the way up to plus or minus two. And then if we wanna calculate the total number of orbitals in a certain energy level or, or a principal quantum number in equal three, we can just count them because if n equals three, L will have three possible values, zero, one, and two. For zero, that's an only one possible combination with M L equals zero, which is one orbital and S orbital. For L, we'll have three possible values for M L, which is plus one, zero and minus one. So we have three orbitals, which are P orbitals in shape. For L equals two, ML can take the values of zero, plus or minus one, and plus or minus two. So that's a total of five orbitals. So it's gonna be one plus three plus five, which is a total of nine orbitals. It might be easier to know that the number of orbitals in any level equals the quantum number squared. So for energy level three is gonna equal three squared, which is nine, which is basically the same results that we got by counting the available orbitals in this case.